Hi, welcome back to a new video. Like we are working on Chapter 6 through 6, which is the early civilization. We're in the Bronze Age, and we're finishing up the uh, river valley civilization, so you can't see the one, which is the quantum or the uh, river valley, uh, which is how basically the civilization that uh, was born in China. So we're looking at the history of China. Uh, this is basically the region where the first uh, uh, Neolithic people live in China, and of course, as you can imagine, they live along the rivers. And uh, that's like other civilizations in India and in Egypt and Mesopotamia. Uh, the the Neolithic people be dependent on the rivers to flood and the uh, soil to uh, be able to produce crops. Now, unlike the others where wheat and barley remain crops in China, we see rice and millet and soybean as their main crops. That I had chickens, they had pigs, uh, that they had cultivated, and they also had silk. Now, this is one of the two major rivers, the Yellow River, or the Huanghe River, and it's known as the Yellow River because there is a mineral in the river called Loas that gives it that yellow brownish color. This is the other river called the Yangtze River. Uh, so, much of the millet, right, it's kind of like a corner looking on the rain, and soybeans. Uh, here we have the silk, right? The silk worm, I should say. Uh, that this is a thin thread of silk that uh, people have in China have been able to use to uh, spin into or form into silk textiles or clothing, uh, to be one of the major, major uh, luxury goods that was seen in the fair uh, throughout the world. Now, China is the last of the river fatter of the cities. Uh, and part of the reason for that is because it is geographically isolated. Uh, so you see that it has a lot of mountain ranges on its, on its borders, uh, especially the Himalayas down here. Uh, there's two deserts, there's one over here, and there's another one up here about the Gobi Desert. We have the Pacific Ocean on the other side. And therefore, it means that information and technology uh, and knowledge uh, that, that is shared in between the region of, of Egypt and Mediterranean and the Indian Valley. Uh, will take longer to really try, and therefore, um, that's why we see the leader of the development of Chinese history. Now, uh, for the dynasty, if you notice know, the Chinese history is divided into dynasty, the dynasty is basically a, a line of rulers, or something from the same family. Uh, the first dynasty is considered to be the Qi dynasty. Uh, they're the first ruler of Japan. Uh, however, they're more of a legendary folkloric folk. Uh, dynasty because they left the Aino written uh, written record, the Aino right. Uh, do know they existed uh, based on the artifact they left behind. Uh, but a lot of the credit or, or stories about them, there's no way to prove it. They uh, did what they're supposed to have done. Uh, so there's very limited information about them. So even though they're technically the first dynasty, we tend to ignore them uh, and not give credit to them for that. On top of that, the Chai Dynasty was extremely small, a very small region that you see over here. Uh, this dark green area all around China, it does basically China nowadays. Uh, so that tiny little corner, that is where the Chai Dynasty had originally performed. Now, the first dynasty that you need to know, the first dynasty uh, in the world history, they you can worry about is the Chai Dynasty. Uh, you notice the Malay has a much larger territory than the uh, predecessor of the Chia uh, dynasty. And the Chai had their own capital cap on Yang. Uh, the, the kings had political and religious power, so they were kind of like priest kings, similar to Egyptian pharaohs or Mesopotamian priest kings. And basically, they formed just like you know, the Babylonian form of the pharaohs. Formed. Uh, their power by conquering surrounding neighbors, surrounding territories, and you can find them under a single ruler. Now, the kings they ruled directly in the city, but they ruled indirectly elsewhere, meaning that because of the size of the territory uh, and the difficulty of communicating and transporting between the capital and the rest of the territories, the king would be delegated or shared from his authority and his own power uh, to other lords, and they would be the capital king. Uh, and we also see the, the, the beginning of the idea of the middle kingdom and the Chinese think of themselves as the liberal center of the world, the middle kingdom. 
and anyone who wasn't part of their society, part of their kingdom, didn't speak their language, and so on, were viewed as barbarians or savages. Now, one of the most uh, feats of the Shang is their tomb. They had these royal tombs where the king could be buried in the capital, and these were absolutely massive tombs. Uh, and and King Imperial would do stuff like uh, weapons, jewelry, tools, clothes, uh, but also by people. For the first time that you served and you were uh, a soldier to the king, and the king passed away, you were expected to do suicide or you'll be killed so that you can continue your service uh, to the king in the afterlife. You know, so it's great uh, honor to be able to die uh, for a long time king. Now, the Shanj, they are built in cities, right, including the capital of Anjana, uh, similar to Egypt, similar to uh, other revitalizations. In this city, you have artisans, who produce goods, uh, and, you know, pottery, and jewelry, and uh, metalwork, and blacksmiths. And then, outside of the cities, you will have the countryside where the farmers live and produce uh, the crops that will feed everyone else. Now, technologies from the other parts of Asia see only the new way to China, uh, including the use of bronze, uh, including the domestic horse, and including the wheel of technology. Now, if you recall, the wheel was actually a American and Mesopotamian invention. Uh, the use of domesticated horses coming from the Central Asia for the Indo Europeans. So, similar to how the Indo Europeans, known as the Aryans, they migrated to the Indians by the in India. Another group of Indo European migrants uh, went to China and they brought with them these technologies. And the government and the people kind of slowly adopted these new technologies uh, that were brought in. And what we see is the Shang Rui, they actually created a monopoly on uh, bronze. Now, bronze is, a, is an alloy, and it is a combination of copper and tin. And the government said that we control all the mines where the copper and tin come from, that belongs to us, you cannot own it. And that's what we call a monopoly. When one person will grow, controls the production and the sale and the uh, purchasing of a product or service, that's what we call a monopoly. So the government said that the only soldiers who can use bronze weapons are the government soldiers. No one else can use bronze weapons. If you're a blacksmith and you can use a stone or a sword, uh, you need like a special permit from the guard in order to do your job. Otherwise, it would be uh, it'll be illegal for you to do it. Now here we have other uh, kind of like fancy ceremonial looking weapons. That they shall have to be also a high level artistic development uh, and craftsmanship in China. Now, the Shang Dynasty they lasted for a while and eventually they, uh, they would fall apart. Uh, they would decline over time and a new dynasty would come and take over and see this happen over and over and over throughout Chinese history. One dynasty weakens, a new dynasty comes to power and overthrows the previous one. In the first case, what we see is it is the Zhao, right? And the Zhao they overthrow the Shang king. So, right? so again, if you look at this map, right, the Shang controlled this orange area. Then the Zhao controlled it and then expanded it with all this yellow region that we see here, right? And other still other dynasties that will come later on. We'll continue that expansion eventually. The point is that the uh, Zhao they will overthrow the king. And then they, they, they would justify this action because, of course, like, people are going to be upset that you vote from the king and say, look, look the kings were not good, they were incompetent, and they were stupid, they messed up. And instead of, uh, instead of living, you know, really stupid kings, we were going to replace them. And he just came up with this idea known as the mandate of heaven. And basically, it says that uh, the king can rule, the dynasty can rule for as long as he wants, as long as they uh, you know, are, are, are good people, that they treat the peasants as good, that they respect the peasants, that they don't get some further taxation on the peasants, uh, and they rule widely in the industry, right? Uh, abuse of power. And that, that, the, that this is a, a mandate or a mission from heaven to rule. 
right? The kind of like the Chinese gods have chosen this family to work in China. And the Zhao said that the previous kings of China, they did not do it, and that the we do trouble until it's over. Right? So this kind of like justification or the explanation as to why it was okay to overthrow uh, the Shah. And again, you see that, you know, we see heaven. Uh, the heavens, the gods are up in the sky, they choose the ruler, and the ruler has to uh, prove himself. And again, if the ruler is proven to be unwise, or unjust, or abusive, then a new dynasty is going to come in and take over. Uh, what would eventually happen to the Zhao. And here we see the, uh, what about the dynastic cycle, right, or the man leader of heaven cycle, right? So we have a new dynasty. It, uh, everything's very and cool and awesome. The, you know, the kingdom and the empire is working really well. The government gets corrupted, right? Because that happens, right? Power corrupts. Then we have natural disasters. So we have famines. So we have wars. So we have revolutions and rebellions. Uh, so people are not happy. So they start complaining. Uh, then the dynasty is considered to have lost the mandate. And then for a new dynasty is going to rise up to take over. And then we begin the cycle again. And so this is about the dynastic cycle, uh, and this kind of idea of, you know, circular history uh, occurs over and over throughout Chinese history, the Chinese, uh, the dynastic history. Now, the Zhao, as I mentioned earlier, they expand their territory, they continue having decentralized government, meaning that the king does not rule every inch of territory, he shares his power between his lord, those lords, those rulers, those nobles, they uh, rule on behalf of the king. Uh, and they're supposed to pay tribute to the king uh, through taxes or through military service. Right, so this is what we're looking at when we're looking at the uh, Xiao dynasty. Right, so the Xiao, uh, their headquarters is right here. This is the capital. Uh, this is their central state right here. So the Zhao King yeah. just ruled this small territory, right? But all the other territories that you see here are ruled by different kings and different lords who all pay tribute and pay um, taxes to the Zhao King. Uh, but this, again, this is decentralized, right? The Zhao rulers do not control every single land, do not control every single territory. Uh, it is through the Zhao that we see the expansion of trade. And they start sending merchants to go all the way across the desert and mountains uh, and make their way to uh, the Indian Valley in India or the Mesopotamia. Uh, we also see a lot of internal trade, right? China is huge. So we see, like, you know, northern parts of China trading with the southern part of China. Uh, so that's an internal trade as well. We see urbanization, so more cities are popping up, and that's the capital. Uh, they start using iron, right? so they, they kind of evolve from going from the bronze weapons to iron technology. Uh, and iron is more durable, it's strong, it's more flexible, it's longer lasting than bronze. And, and with these iron tools, iron weapons, uh, iron farming implements that you see here, is called a plow. Right? And basically, allows the farmer to dig a straight line in the earth, allowing you to your seeds to just. Uh, in a very organized fashion. And the point is that with new, new technology coming to China and developing within China, we see the food service rapidly in China and starts expanding rapidly faster than anyone else. And that's been the case pretty much since, you know, even in modern times. So uh, you have a lot more, more cities being formed. And in these cities, you have, you know, government officials, you have merchants, just like we see seen elsewhere. And then we see uh, the building roads, right? The Zhao and the king start building roads, right? To connect all these different cities with each other. So it's easier to trade. Uh, new inventions, uh, for example, the Chinese are the first to invent the gospel, right? Which allowed um, untrained soldiers to be able to shoot at a long distance. Because a bow and arrow is much more difficult to get a, a lot of training to use the bow and arrow properly. Uh, so the, the, uh, the crossbow made it more easier. There were the first ones to develop it. Uh, the Tsars uh, uh, adapted the use of the ivory, that soldiers on the first And war chariots that you see in this picture, 
right, we have one right layer, and you have one person with a sword, and then another person shooting for an arrow. And these would be units, these type of units would be used in battle, and it would be very set up against soldiers who are walking on foot. Now, little by little, we see that as the Jab Dynasty territory gets bigger and bigger, uh, they start their territory starts uh, coming under their continual attack. Uh, from Asian people, from the steppes region of Asia, right? That's central with Asian people. And basically, the steppe people, they're looking for, you know, uh, land. They're looking for tools, looking for weapons, looking for supplies. And the agricultural people of China uh, have, you know, have the tools and the weapons and the luxury goods. But, uh, they become like easy targets. And these Zhao, they are unable, they are incapable of defending their territory from these outsiders coming in. So we see a rebellion certainly taking place. Um, where the rebellion is about saying, hey, you're not going to be good at attacking this. We need more help. And if you can help us, then we're going to make some of us who will. So they start supporting the royal lord. Remember what we said earlier? Um, you know, these regions, each one of these will have their own lore. So if the job is going to do their job, then they're going to get someone else. Right, so you have these, these you know, people coming in from the outside uh, into China, attacking whether it's from north or from west. Uh, they're coming in and attacking, and if the job king isn't able to do his job, then someone else has to come out. So it certainly is a decline of the job. And eventually, what leads to a time period called the War of Mercedes period. Uh, and as the house is a little bit, the job can be basically starts to say, you know, we can't protect you, so uh, but we're going to give you more and more power to the lords. And these lords, uh, we used to sort of like share uh, power with the king. Now they pretty much do whatever they want. So little by little, they start fighting each other. And then they're saying, you know, we could be the next dynasty, we should be the next dynasty. So we have kind of a massive civil war within China, and so it's about the war of state period. Each state or each little kingdom within China uh, is fighting each other to see who's going to eventually take over uh, the king, uh, the Zhao king. And the Zhao king, they're unable to, to stop the member. They were too weak to the centralized, to the organized, to stop invasion from coming in and stealing stuff. Uh, they're definitely going to be unable to stop their own lord from rising up and rebelling against them. Not to mention that with the arrival of the iron, every lord, or every group, every army that these lords will have had their own uh, iron wire. That's right, because they replaced the bronze weapons. So everyone will be on each foot and they can use technology and weapons. So they're going to be fighting each other. There. And the Zhao King will be basically unable to uh, control his territory anymore. So this is again the War of State period. Right? The Zhao will have lost its territory. Uh, they will have lost the mandate of heaven. No one listens to the Zhao King anymore. You have different cities. The each one claiming that they are the true rulers of the uh, of China and like I said this is a long civil war uh, so over 250 years. Eventually we will see the rise of a new dynasty that will unify all these different states, all these different uh, small territories into one large kingdom again, one large empire and that will be the change that you feel here. Uh, but that will come again in a future chapter. Alright, that's it for the final part of part one. See you again next time.